All right. Um, we're going to talk about the diarrhea as a broad category today. Um, I'm Dr. Brian Moffin. I'm from the VA, and I'm one of the uh, assistant professors of medicine in the medicine department. Um, we're going to start off with a discussion of acute diarrhea, and then we'll talk about chronic diarrhea. Acute diarrhea is, of course, the situation that you deal with most in the hospitals. So the first thing we need to do is we need to define what is diarrhea. So when we talk about diarrhea, the traditional definition was more than 200 grams of stool per day. Uh, that's a little difficult to measure and, and figure that out. So what we've moved to more is just you have loose or watery bowel movements more than three times per day. So when we talk about diarrhea, there's really four types. Okay? And it depends upon what the likely etiologies are, what determines these types. So the first main group is acute community-acquired diarrhea. Acute diarrhea is defined as diarrhea of lasting less than two weeks in duration. It's most commonly caused by viral etiologies with 87% of cases there, and then about 13% of cases tend to be bacterial. Um, bacterial cases tend to last closer to the seven days, and viral cases tend to last only about 72 hours. Acute community can occasionally be C. diff in about 2% of cases, so you need to be on the lookout for patients who may come from the community but have had recent hospitalizations in the past month or so, or been on recent antibiotic therapy up to even almost a month in the past. Also pay attention if a patient is immunosuppressed, as, though the, as these patients with acute diarrhea may have a typical organism, such as cryptosporidae and microsporidae, isospora, viral causes, or mycobacterial etiologies. The other category we see very frequently, particularly in the hospitalized setting, is nosocomial diarrhea, which is diarrhea that starts after 72 hours. Once you're more than 72 hours in a hospital, it is highly improbable that you have food poisoning because your food is coming from the, ca the cafeteria or the food production center in your hospital. So therefore, all the patients would be ill. In nine years, as this has happened once, the entire hospital had vomiting and diarrhea all in one week period. So it won't be subtle if that's the case. So we don't have to worry about all these etiologies up here. Now the main thing we need to focus on is this is caused by a medication, usually antibiotics, or other things that you receive in the hospital, such as CT contrast, which very commonly causes diarrhea, the oral contrast you drink. And are you going to need medications in your inpatient state to cause diarrhea? Nothing's more embarrassing than being an intern presenting to an attending saying the patient has diarrhea and you're not sure why. And the medication list lists the guys on Seneca S scheduled and docusave. So make sure that you pay attention to what the patient's already getting in the hospital first. Also, two peaks can have an osmotic effect. And then, if you don't have the antibiotic or the, the other drug-associated problems, be aware that C. diff. Now, frequently people fixate on C. diff, but in studies, only about 20% of cases of inpatient diarrhea are actually from C. diff. So look at the medications and other causes first before you run to that. The third category is subacute community acquired diarrhea. Why do I mention that? It's because just keep in your mind as you're moving from acute diarrhea to chronic diarrhea, which is the last category, there's a period of time where it's unlikely to be viruses or bacterial infections, but it's not yet quite what we call chronic. So in that category, you want to start thinking, could the patient have cryptosporidia, giardia, some sort of parasitic infection at that point? Because most bacterial or viral infections will have ended before you reach that stage. The last category is chronic diarrhea, which is diarrhea that has lasted for more than four weeks. Once you reach that chronic state, you start thinking of things like inflammatory bowel disease, cancer, something atypical in this patient's presentation. So what are our etiologies of acute community-acquired diarrhea or subacute diarrhea? As we talked about, viral etiologies are most common. As you can see, common viruses are norovirus, rotavirus, adenovirus, and the flu. In terms of bacterial infections, which account for a much smaller percentage, we kind of subdivide that into three categories. We can have severe watery diarrhea, dysentery, which is bloody diarrhea, and we can have vomiting predominant diarrhea. If we have a case of bloody diarrhea, that narrows it down for us. It's usually it's caused by Shigella, Campylobacter, E. coli, and interinvasive or 0157H7 hemorrhagic E. coli or we have Nursia analytica. Occasionally, it can be salmonella as well. When you have watery diarrhea, we think of salmonella, enrotoxigenic E. coli, Vibrio, and Listeria. And then when we have patients with vomiting predominant, that's usually from preformed toxins. And we're thinking of organisms like Bacillus cereus, Staph aureus, preformed toxins in the food, 
or Clostridium perfringens. <coughs> so a guy who comes in with vomiting and diarrhea would be either viral or a uh, B. serious Staph aureus type case. In nosocomial diarrhea, which is another form of acute diarrhea, sort of a subtype, um, what we're most worried about is C. diff, but most common again is drugs and other etiology, so we need to review the medication list and recent testing. In the category of subacute diarrhea, we're protozoal, rarely bacterial, parasitic infections, and viral. We're talking about protozoal, cryptosporidia, isospora, microsporidia, and, and uh, what was last one? Cyclospora. We might think that those cases are only in HIV or immunosuppressed patients, but cryptosporidia is actually one of the top causes of diarrhea lasting more than seven days in immunocompetent patients as well. So it is something to keep in mind in those cases. In bacterial infections, salmonella is the one that tends to last and hold on longer here. Uh, any of them can. The big ones you want to look at that are protracted are either the mycobacterial infections. Uh, again, immunosuppressed patients would be very un unusual in a patient who's not a transplant patient or an HIV patient. And then aromonas and plesiomonas. Aromonas and plesiomonas are commonly found in well water. Um, and contaminated water supplies. So in, if you're drinking city water and live in downtown Louisville, it's unlikely you have those organisms. Then parasites are Giardia, Inamoeba, and Strongyloides. Out of these, Giardia is associated with travel to Russia or overseas, and Strongyloides is associated with two states in the United States. It used to be endemic throughout the entire country, but at the WH I think it's the WHO. The CDC has currently limited it down to two states where it's likely, which is the state of Kentucky and Tennessee. Strongyloides is common everywhere in the U.S. and lives in the soil and can crawl in your feet, causing what people commonly used to call ground itch. Uh, but because people wear shoes now, it's almost vanished except in two states where there is still some testing showing that it's rare but does occur, which are unfortunately the state we're in. So don't go barefoot in cow pastures. The last one are viral causes, and viral causes are almost exclusively in patients with severe immunosuppressed states, people on chemotherapy, transplant patients, patients with HIV, things like that. So in general, you won't have to worry about CMV and HSV. So when we talk to the patients, what are the key points when they come in with an acute diarrhea to the ER and you're called down to evaluate them or you see them in a clinic and they come in? It's do they meet the definition, first of all, is it more than three bowel movements a day? A patient who's having one loose bowel movement a day doesn't really have diarrhea per se. Also, how long does it last for? It's critical that we narrow it down to acute, subacute, or chronic diarrhea. Do they have immunosuppression or HIV that makes us worry about viral infections, cryptosporidia, or some of those atypical parasitic organisms? Do a medication review. Do they have any, any etiologies that would be causing diarrhea? Have they recently been hospitalized or had antibiotics, which are risk factors for C. diff? And then make sure, and this is the one thing I see people always forget to do, make sure that you ask about the protozoal risk factors. Does the patient live in a city or a rural environment? Do they drink city water, well water, or cistern water, which is a rainwater collecting system? Have they been on any trips outside where they might have been exposed or drank raw, un unprocessed water? And have they had any recent travel? The other thing that's really important is look for blood and stool, which could represent a more pathologic process than require a more aggressive diagnostic approach. So this is really the sort of meat and potatoes of what we want to do here. When we have a patient with diarrhea, this is sort of a breakdown of the general algorithm and the thought process you should do. Everyone doesn't need a workup. So what do we need to do? We need to look for red flags. If we have red flags in a case, that patient does need an evaluation. So if our patient comes in, they're healthy, they have no issues of any kind, they don't look particularly sick, and they're complaining of it usually to an office setting, then that patient really should just be managed with conservative care. With oral hydration therapy, you consider things like Pepto-Bismol. You can consider giving the patient a brief course of loperamide to help with the diary until it resolves, which should be less than a week. So what are our red flags? Does the patient appear severely dehydrated? Like, does your exam look like they're very ill? Does the patient have a duration of diarrhea of more than 48 to 72 hours, which would make it atypical for a viral etiology, which is the overwhelming majority of cases? Does the patient have a fever? Does the patient have bloody bowel movements? Do they have severe abdominal pain that might suggest a more pathologic process? Are they immunocompromised? Are they elderly over the age of 70? Or do they have recent travel? Any of these red flags indicates that I need to take a closer look at that patient. So what do I mean by a closer look?
If I think there's something more serious and particularly bacterial going on, because remember viral, there's not a lot I'm going to do about it, then what I need to do is do a CBC, a BMP, and a fecal lactoferrin, or some older labs may be doing fecal leukocytes. Fecal leukocytes are where they smear the stool and look at it. Fecal lactoferrin is actually looking for lactoferrin released by white cells in response to inflammation. It does not mean infection, it just means inflammation. But finding inflammation makes it less likely that it is a viral etiology. And that is the whole purpose here, is I don't really need to do workups when it is viral. And that test, lactoferrin, is about 95-97% sensitive. So I get those three tests, and in select cases, I may consider abdominal x-ray. An older, demented patient, someone with nerve problems or issues where they could have a fecal impaction with encopheresis, I should get an abdominal x-ray. And anyone with severe excruciating pain or bloody diarrhea, I would have a low threshold of potentially doing a CT of their abdomen. We want to rule out things like appendicitis, diverticulitis, or some sort of severe toxic megacolon or colitis that could be uh, more dangerous in those cases. If my fecal lactoferrin comes back negative, and the patient isn't having blood or any severe toxic signs, then I would just put them back on oral therapy and send them out with sort of re uh, regular type care. If the patient, on the other hand, is fecal lactoferrin positive, they appear severely ill or they're having bloody diarrhea, then I'd want to send additional testing. And what does that mean? It means what category am I in? Everyone should get sort of the acute workup. I need to do a stool culture to look for common organisms that could make this patient sick. Um, if I have to separately order it, I would want to consider E. coli 0157 and shiga-like toxins on the stool. Um, I don't know universities set up at the VA, all this is done automatically. You just have one stool culture does all these tests. Um, if the patient has travel you would want, or risk factors in a rural setting, well water, things like that, you would want to check ONP. I want to stress one point. ONP is actually done on three consecutive days. It is not done one time and done. It's not a one and done test. That's because there's variable ova shedding by most of those parasitic organisms. Uh, I also, if they're having uh, bloody diarrhea and they've traveled, I might want to consider an amoeba. Or if they've traveled and they're having non-bloody diarrhea that's severe, I might consider GRD of stool antigen testing, since ONP and other testing is not as exact. If they've had recent hospitalization or antibiotics, I would also want to send a C. diff testing, either an ELISA or a PCR, depending upon its availability. PCR is the more sensitive test. If, on the other hand, I have a patient who's immunocompromised, I would want to get these tests first to rule it out, but I would want to additionally consider testing for cryptosporidia, microsporidia, isospora, cyclospora, etc., and consider an acid fasting. So if an HIV patient with a very low CD4 count with diarrhea, I might want to do an AFB to look for MAC in that case. Um, CMV would be more that once MAC is negative and all the other testing is negative, since that would be much less common. But you could consider a CMV PCR on the stool or an antibody testing. The last is if it's been more than 14 days. Now I'm going to, this might not be a general kind of common and acute, then I might also want to consider ONP testing and specific testing for cryptosporidia isis for et cetera. Again, at the VA, they do this huge panel on all the stool cultures. Um, they do a, the full Shigella, Salmonella, E. coli. They also actually do all the Isospora, Cryptosporidia, and all that there, and Aeromonas and Plesiomonas as well, if you've got well water exposure. If I have a patient who has nosocomial diarrhea, meaning they came into the hospital, I don't do that. If the patient's been in the hospital and they came in the first day and they get diarrhea the first day, maybe they're demented, confused, they didn't tell me, or it could be part of their overall illness, then I might consider doing that. But if they've been in the hospital for more than 48 hours or 72 hours, then at that point, the further out I get from admission, the more sure I am it's not a community-acquired diarrhea. Because as I said, if I got it from some sort of food supply, which is mainly what we're worried about, probably everyone in the hospital would be ill. So now I need to go through a medication review and take a look and see if I have antibiotics that are at high risk, such as augmentin, which causes diarrhea in 25% of patients, clindamycin, things like that. Am I getting laxatives or stool softeners, magnesium compounds, anything that would give me loose stool? And the first step, if I have any of those things, is to consider stopping them or altering it. Or if I couldn't alter it, I might use an anti-motility agent. Well, you could say, well, maybe I have C. diff, I should just send C. diff to be safe. There is a downside to C. diff testing. When I do a C. diff PCR, it has a very high false positive rate. What does that mean? It means I may have some DNA in a PCR test 
poor C. diff and not have an active C. diff infection in my bowel. Right? We may be carriers but not be actively infected. The specificity is not so great on that test, but the sensitivity is very, very good. The flip side, I could do an antigen test. The antigen test is fairly specific for an active infection because I have to have enough load of antigen, but the sensitivity of that test is only 60 to 70 percent. So there's a trade-off for either of those tests. That's why it's really important that you first eliminate etiologies that would be more common and cause 80 percent of this diarrhea by reviewing the chart and looking at your patient. Do they get oral contrast? Are they on any medication? Stop those. Now, where might you want to go ahead and just send the C. diff without doing uh, up front? That would be somebody who's having fevers, infectious signs, climbing white count, things that make you say, this probably is not a drug reaction, this is probably a C. diff infection. So if the guy's white count's 8,000 on one day and on the next day his white count's 17,000 and he's having diarrhea, you might think of C. diff. Also, the, you, the longer you get out from the antibiotics, the more likely C. diff. So if I start augmenting today and tomorrow the guy gets diarrhea, it's highly improbable he has C. diff. It'd be very unusual for it to start that early. Usually it takes at least three days. All right? And the average actually is about seven to ten days to start getting a C. diff infection after the initiation of antibiotics. So keep that in mind. I think we do too many C. diff tests. And particularly with the PCR test, if you get a result that may not represent a true infection, then you're treating someone unnecessarily. All right. Any questions on that? Okay, once you have a patient who has diarrhea and they meet some of the criteria, uh, do they really need to be hospitalized? Uh, if they have severe abdominal pain or blood, they probably should be observed. If they're unable to take oral or if they have severe electrolyte abnormalities or renal failure, they're going to need IV fluids and need at least a short-term admission to the hospital. Um, once they're in the hospital, you want to try to give people oral therapy. You want to make sure you reinforce the patient not to auto-infect by good hand-washing techniques. Um, and some people advocate using less lactose products because of an induced lactase and, uh, deficiency once you get a small bowel infection or inflammation. Uh, there's no real data behind that. Symptomatically, you can use loperamide in anyone unless they have basically C. diff or signs of toxic megacolon or a lot of bleeding. So people are sometimes a little cautious about that, but you can control their symptoms, get their electrolytes fixed, and move them out, assuming they don't have an etiology of more concern. Uh, antibiotics are rarely indicated. The main case would be traveler's diarrhea or bloody diarrhea with only three days of ciprofloxacin. If you get a culture result and you did it and it gives you information, then you could consider treatment in that case, those cases, though the majority of cases of salmonella or things like that are self-limited in and of themselves and don't necessarily require antibiotics. Um, if you have things like cryptosporidia, you consider nitizanide or other antibiotics. Uh, Bactrim can be used in isospora, cyclospora. Microsporidia is treated with albendazole. These are kind of things that have popped up on your boards. I don't know if they might ask you what the next best step of treatment is. Generally, just look that up if you find one of those organisms. Um, and if you have C. diff, uh, make sure you check the IDSA guidelines and determine the severity of the case. So if I have a nosocomial infection, my C. diff PCR comes back, the next thing I need to do is the biggest mistake I see people make. I need to categorize the patient as mild. Uh, severe or fulminant cases, moderate, severe or fulminant. If I'm a mild case, I don't have any major abnormalities. If I'm moderate, severe kind of case, I have a patient who has an elevated white count, more than 15,000. I'm having more than 10 bowel movements per day. I have blood. I have a uh, patient with severe electrolyte abnormalities or renal failure, those kind of things. I need to treat them more aggressively with oral vancomycin. If it's mild, metronidazole. This is not in the IDSA guidelines. Currently, our ID department is recommending people who are NAP1, which is a more pathogenic type, be treated with oral vancomycin as well. And then if they're fulminant, meaning they have shock or signs of toxic megacolon on imaging, you need to give them additional IV metronidazole. So anyone who goes to the unit, IV metronidazole, oral vancomycin, the other categories, look at the severity based off their labs and everything else and consider oral vancomycin. So the short of that is metronidazole is not the only treatment. Any questions on acute diarrhea or nosocomial diarrhea? Okay. Chronic diarrhea is diarrhea lasting more than four weeks. And this is really the hardest part of diarrhea. When you have someone with chronic diarrhea, we have to be very organized and we have to really think our way through it in a careful way. Otherwise, we order a bunch of confusing and discrepant tests and we don't know what's going on.
The first thing when anyone comes in with chronic diarrhea is, is their chronic diarrhea a pathologic process? There's two kind of things that could be going on um, other than chronic diarrhea. One would be a patient who's really complaining of incontinence. So make sure you pin down if they're really having diarrhea. The other thing would be IBS. So if a patient says, I've had diarrhea for months and months and months, the question is, is it IBS or is it a true chronic diarrhea that requires workup? So a lot of people say IBS is a diet of exclusion. Well, you could go and spend a half a million dollars doing CAT scans, C-scopes, and all that. Should you do that? No. IBS really should be diagnosed on clinical grounds. But you have to get rid of all the red flags first. So signs that it's IBS and not chronic diarrhea would be that it's more than a year in duration and the patient has no abnormalities on their labs. It would be highly improbable to have any of the pathologic processes under the chronic diarrhea and not have at least anemia or anything abnormal. So if all your labs are stone cold normal, the patient probably does not have a true chronic diarrhea, they have an IBS syndrome. Um, and then you would do the wrong criteria. If you have an absence of nocturnal symptoms, that would suggest that it's also IBS. It doesn't ever tend to wake people up. So if waking up at night's a red flag, you need to be more cautious. If it alternates with constipation, that would be a suggestion that it's not one of these chronic diarrheas, but it's IBS. The others do not cause constipation. And then you can have these major red flags, such as weight loss, blood in your stool. Uh, starting at an older age, IBS usually starts young. It doesn't start in people in their 60s and 70s. Um, iron deficiency being found on labs or anemia in general. Um, and patients who are using heavy NSAID use or having other signs of abdominal pain. Uh, if it's unclear whether it could be IBS or a pathologic process, a good test, and this is what this test was designed for, is calprotectin. Calprotectin is just a sign, another type of inflammatory test um, for the stool, sort of like fecal lactoferrin. If a calprotectin is positive, it would suggest there is either an infectious IBD or other patho cancer or other pathologic process. And in those cases, uh, you'd want to do a workup. And if it's negative, it strongly supports that it is IBS, and then you would not need to do further testing. So some people defer to that in, in questionable cases or to get reassurance. Do you know anything about the sensitivity or the specificity of calprotectin? Uh, calprotectin, it's not really designed to be, I, it depends on what you, which direction we're talking about. Um, the sensitivity is supposed to be in the high 90s for inflammatory states of the bowel, like for an actual pathologic process, um, the, uh, which would mean that the negative predictive value for something bad was pretty high. Um, specificity for IBS, I don't know that I've read of that written specifically. I'd have to go back and look at it again. What are the etiologies of chronic diarrhea? It's a very daunting slide. That's why I'm saying when we get to the algorithm next, we have to be very, very organized. There's a ton of things up here. But there's a concept. And the concept will get you through any board questions. It'll get you through the real world. And the concept is simply this. We don't care about the specific diagnosis up front. We care about getting in the correct category. So we have to get in the correct category. And we have four categories. We have inflammatory diarrhea, fatty diarrhea, osmotic diarrhea, and secretory diarrhea. One of the important things to understand about these categories is all diarrhea is secretory or osmotic. All diarrhea is secretory or osmotic or some mixture of those two. So inflammatory is frequently secretory, may have a maladsorptive osmotic component thrown in. Patients who have fatty diarrhea are always osmotic because they have a malabsorption problem. So I don't care about secretory and osmotic until I've ruled out these two categories. That's the major thought approach you need to have going into this, is to see if they fit in these categories first, and then you might consider this stuff. All right? So when I get a patient, you know, what are the most common things? And I've kind of highlighted these here. If I have an inflammatory diarrhea, I'm worried about cancer. I'm worried about inflammatory bowel disease. And then I'm worried about infectious agents that could be protracted, particularly in immunosuppressed patients. Uh, if I have a patient who has fatty diarrhea, I'm mainly dividing it into a group of maldigestion and malabsorption. The malabsorption means I have a problem more with carbohydrates and things like that, but I mean, it's a small bowel source of the problem. So I'm talking about celiac disease is the main one I worry about. 
and deal with short gut or bacterial overgrowth. So mainly focus on thinking about and reading about on your own as a subtype. Celiac disease, make sure you understand it. Make sure you understand bacterial overgrowth, the criteria and the signs of that and why people get it. In maldigestion, I'm mainly talking about people who burned out their pancreas. So people with a recurrent acute pancreatitis in the past, heavy drinking, things like that, I'm worried about that being their main etiology. If I have eliminated both of these and I find out I have an osmotic diarrhea, then I'm talking about ingestion diarrhea, meaning I'm ingesting something I can't absorb that is causing me to have diarrhea, such as a lot of diabetic candies from the, from the candy store at the mall. Or I have some sort of laxative in my diet that I may not have been aware of or in my medication list. If I don't have that, then I'm thinking of carbohydrate malabsorption. Um, and again, I'm kind of back to that kill overgrowth and celiac disease. Why is it in two places? Well, my test may have been negative for fatty diarrhea, but I may still have an osmotic diarrhea. Okay? But I don't jump to this, this first. All right, and one of the most common ones is lactose um, is uh, lactose intolerance. If I have secretory diarrhea, then the most common thing I see that ends up in the hospital and people complain of diarrhea for years and years and no one's really addressed it has been ileal uh, bile acid malabsorption. We get a lot of people who went to surgery and had a resection of their right hemicolon and they come in and they've had chronic diarrhea ever since then, either in a bag or if they get reattached chronically through the anus. So why do they have it? The bile acid is absorbed in the, the distal terminal ileum. Even a very small resection of the terminal ileum can lead to bile acid malabsorption. Uh, so that is a very common etiology. So make sure you pay very close attention to the surgical history in any patient who comes in with chronic diarrhea. Uh, you want to remove them for phenothaline or drugs. Uh, you consider endocrine disorders here like thyroid disease or adrenal insufficiency. That's pretty rare. And then out of the neuroendocrine, the one most likely to be on your boards is Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Uh, the reason for that is that about 30% of cases of Zollinger-Ellison present with diarrhea before they're later diagnosed. And I don't think I have it up here. It's also perineoplastic. Also, a huge percentage of people with hepatocellular carcinoma present with di chronic diarrhea well before they're ever diagnosed with that as well. Um, oh, wait, I do have it. I Except I didn't put it under here. So that should have hepatocellular as well. Villus adenomas or colon or small bowel tumors are another possible source. Okay, so that's kind of the overview. Now, when I talk to the patient, it's very important in chronic diarrhea that I take a very good history. Most of this is through the history to kind of guide me. When I'm going into these categories, I don't want to go in blind. I want some preconceived notion of what's probably going on with the patient. And if I got a slam dunk on the history, then I may just skip to testing there. You don't always have to follow this algorithm for when you're not clear on what's going on. So the first thing is, again, do they really have the definition of diarrhea? How long have they had it? Is it really chronic? Is there blood, mucus, or pain? Those would be signs that it's an inflammatory diarrhea. Does the patient have greasy, fatty stools, things like that, that would suggest a malabsorptive diarrhea or fatty diarrhea? Does the patient have incontinence, dementia, or other organic brain disease? Because sometimes family members report diarrhea, and it's really that the patient's urinating into the stool, and it's mainly a concern about cleaning the patient up. Also, does the diarrhea wake the patient up at night? If that happens, it means it's a secretory slash inflammatory diarrhea. Osmotic or maladaptive diarrheas don't tend to wake you up later because they relate to the food you ingest or the product you're ingesting. Um, do you notice that it relates to foods? You don't want to miss lactose intolerance, which is very common and would be easy to avoid. Look and see if they're eating diabetic candies. Uh, check on what kind of water and exposure, just like in the acute diarrhea, to see if they could possibly have a parasitic infection. Make sure you focus on bowel surgeries. Like I said, this is one of the most common things I've seen over and over and over. And then, does the patient have a history of pancreatitis or any cancers? They get radiation that could have damaged their bowels, cause chronic prostatitis and some low, small stools in the colon, anything like that. Any family history of Crohn's disease or UC or cancers that would make me lean towards that state. And make sure you review their medications very closely. Just pull up their med list, check it, and see if any of those drugs have associated diarrhea with it. And then look for weight loss, which would be a sign of malignancy or a malabsorptive syndrome where they're not able to get enough uh, in with ingestion. So this is a big algorithm. But again, it's really not as hard as you may think because we have to get in the category. Once you're in the category, you can read up, look at your patient, try to sort out what's going on. And what you'll find is in these sub boxes, 
it's kind of poorly defined. This is from the AGA and the European guidelines on chronic diarrhea. I've kind of put stuff together and tried to smooth it out. It's very chaotic when you try to read it. And that's because I don't think people have a good sense of an organized way to do it because there's so many possibilities. So use your common sense, your history, and all that to tie together once you're in here. These are kind of rough guidelines. The main thing is to get in the right category. So what do we want to do first? When someone comes with chronic diarrhea, we want to get our basic labs, our CBC, CMP, consider a TSH and an HIV. That way we have some ballpark idea, is this really pathologic? If all their labs are stone cold normal, thyroid's fine, they don't have HIV, then it may be an IBS type syndrome. We may want to just watch the patient, do wrong criteria, things like that, consider uh, the calprotectin. If the patient, um, if the patient is abnormal on these, you can also ask them to fast for a protracted period, and that helps you tell if it's malabsorptive. If their diarrhea vanishes when they're not eating for 24 hours, that would be a sign that there's a malabsorptive disorder. And consider asking the patient to go for a while without any sort of dairy products, given the, the very common um, etiology of, of lactose intolerance. I think there was one paper, over 10% of people with IBS diagnosis actually were found to have lactose intolerance once they were put on a, a diet free of that. So once I do those things and get an idea of kind of what's going on, I need to order some tests. I don't need to order a billion dollar workup. I need to start with tests to help me get organized into what category the patient is. So a stool pH is useful. A stool pH is useful because a stool pH would suggest whether the patient has a carbohydrate malabsorption. The normal stool pH is a sort of 5.6, 5.8 range. It's a high or higher than that, so it's a sort of a more of an alkalotic or normal. Um, pH. If I have a lot of carbohydrates left in my stool because I'm not absorbing it, the bacteria break it down and release a lot of acid waste products. So the pH drops very low, usually less than 5.3. So a pH less than 5.3 is suggestive, but not greatly sensitive for a uh, carbohydrate malabsorption. But a very high stool pH would make carbohydrate malabsorption very unlikely. So it's very useful for kind of removing that a little bit from my differential. If I have a fecal leukocyte, a cold blood, and lactoferrin, both negative, both those tests are very sensitive but nonspecific for inflammation of the bowel. If they're both negative, I can almost always take that off my board. It's very unlikely the patient has it. The false positive breaks through the roof, though, so you're going to have a lot of time in that category when that's not what's wrong with the patient. Okay? And then I could have a Sudan stain, which is a qualitative fecal fat, and that allows me to see if the patient has signs of a fatty malabsorptive diarrhea. Um, if, and that test, though, only has a decent sensitivity if I've been eating fat. So you can't do this test on someone who's NPO or on a healthy heart diet in the hospital. Ask the patient's family to bring, if they're in the hospital, ask them to bring in Big Macs, let them eat all sorts of awful stuff, get nutrition involved to give them a really unhealthy diet. Or if they're at home, just tell them to eat like garbage for a few days until they bring it and then collect their stool and test it. So you want to basically create the situation where you'll have it for that test to be useful. If you still suspect it and you got a false, uh, or got a negative test result, you can also do a 72-hour quantitative stool. That's hard for families and people to collect. It's it's hard to kind of get that situation done, and it takes extra time. So generally, we do like a spot Sudan stain on the stool. And the last test you want to go ahead and order, but not look at, is stool electrolytes. The reason I say that is again. All diarrhea is secretory osmotic. You'll get yourself all confused and obsess about that if you look at that test. We have to get rid of the other two categories before we kind of go down that route. Okay? Because again, if I have an inflammatory diarrhea, I'm going to get secretory. Then I go and I look at my secretory chart. I'm obsessing about all that. And I didn't really stick with the, the results on the test. Uh, I'm going to talk about it though. What is that test? How is it done? First of all, we don't order stool osmolarity and we don't order serum osmolarity. What we say is that a normal person's osmoles are between 280 and 320 milliosmoles. So we'll just say your serum should be pretty normal as long as your sodium values are normal around 290. So I take 290 and I subtract two times the sodium plus the potassium. What am I doing? What I'm looking at is if I have a secretory diarrhea, I'm losing a lot of sodium and potassium into my stool and that's what's creating the watery stool. Therefore, the sodium potassium levels are high. And as I subtract that from the gap of the normal serum, which the idea here is if I have cholera, right, I'm actually leaking pure plasma. That's the, quant the quintessential secretory diarrhea is cholera. 
I'd be leaking that in. It would have the same, and my gap would be zero. Not really, but close. So as I leak more and more sodium potassium, I get closer to cholera, that gap gets smaller and smaller. So if I have a gap that is less than 50, it suggests secretory. On the flip side, if I have a malabsorbed carbohydrate that pulls water into the lumen of my bowel, the sodium and potassium that's in that fluid is actually going to be very low because it's just water flowing in. And it's going to actually dilute out any sodium and potassium that might be there. And I get a very wide gap between what my serum osmol is and what the osmol uh, calculation of the stool is. So when I get a gap that's more than 125, that would suggest there's an osmotic problem. In between is probably a mixed result. Does everyone understand that idea? I want you to understand how to do it and know what tests you should order, but, and you need to do it up front because you got to get all your stool tests at once kind of here. But don't obsess about it until you get more information. All right, once I did it, I categorized the patient as we talked about into being a fatty diarrhea because the Sudan's positive or positive inflammatory markers suggesting the patient has an inflammatory diarrhea. Once I know that, I go to the category. So if I have an inflammatory diarrhea, then I have to ask myself, what have I figured out from the patient's exam, their history, any other testing someone else might have done? Does it look infectious or non-infectious? Someone who traveled, someone who has a lot of exposures, maybe I think it's infectious. If it comes in and the guy has a big history of inflammatory bowel disease, a bunch of weight loss, things like that, I might lean more towards a non-infectious source. And so if I think it's infectious, I would order a large collection of tests on the stool uh, in terms of culture, O and P, uh, GRD and other testing. If they have HIV, I consider viral testing, etc. If that's all negative, then I go to my scopes and CAT scans to get a closer look and see what's going on. One point I want to point out that people forget. If I get a negative EGD and C scope on a patient with an inflammatory diarrhea and my CAT scan didn't show anything really obvious, there is still the possibility they have Crohn's disease, which could be in the small bowel but not cause enough inflammatory changes on the CAT scan. A small bowel follow-through is one of the tests you may get on your boards to look for Crohn's disease. So if the other tests are negative, you consider going for that because it could be missed. Now in the modern era, um, we do also have potentially, some people, though it's a little risky with strictures, you could also do a capsule study to look for inflammatory disease throughout the bowel. Or now I suppose they have the single double balloon enteroscopy, though I haven't personally seen any papers that looking at Crohn's with that. I'm sure it would work. So there's other ways to evaluate it, but you want to take a close look at the small bowel if it's inflammatory and the rest is negative. Uh, if you're not sure where to start, this is not really all that terribly expensive. You could start with the infectious workup and then try to arrange the C-scopes and, and scans. If I get the fatty result, which is the one I'm looking for, then I need to decide, do I think my patient has risk factors or a history of pancreatic disease or not? If I think they have pancreatic disease, I need to go down the route of getting thin cuts through the pancreas to look for chronic pancreatitis. If it's negative or questionable, consider EUS or MRCP. I put it up here, chymotrypsin and secretin. Chymotrypsin is a so-so test that's done on the stool. Secretin is actually only done in two centers in the U.S. I think Mayo is one of them. So you're really not going to ever be able to do that test anyway, so it's pretty pointless. Uh, if you're out of these categories, osmotic, we're going to look for, again, that low pH and carbohydrate. If it's negative, we're going to do the xylose testing, which is where we give xylose and check out the, uh, the urinary excretion. It's a very sensitive test, but not terribly specific. If it comes up positive, then we would consider specific uh, carbohydrate malabsorption testing. Uh, with breath test, or uh, we can consider EGD, because the big thing we're looking for in this category is either a bacterial overgrowth, less likely celiac disease, or a direct like in, uh, lactose deficiency or things like that. And again, in Europe, a lot of times they do two things. They give people either a lactose-free diet and see, and, or celiac-free diet and see if they do better, and then determine other testing from there. Or they give people a quart milk test. They make them drink an entire quart of milk, and if they get diarrhea, and really bad cramps, and they consider them to have lactose and put them on a lactose-free diet and, and really push them to do that. If it looks like it's a secretory diarrhea with a very small osmotic gap, then I want to first rule out any infectious sources with these relatively cheap tests. Then I go to my CAT scan and C-scopes to rule out structural disease. And then after that, I would consider very expensive selective testing. And I want to stress there's kind of an approach here. Because there's nothing worse than people ordering VIP, gastrin, 5-hydroxy, endoacetic acid, and, and tons of tests that cost hundreds of dollars when you could have done another test first. And you have to consider the clinical history. 
Just to touch on the main ones you potentially could see on your board, gastrin is for Zollinger Ellison. That's the most likely one that would pop up on a board exam. So if someone has a secretory diarrhea and nothing else obviously wrong on them, they give you some blurb about GERD symptoms, something else, you can use Zollinger Ellison. But remember, it may not even have gastric symptoms for a while with diarrhea being the first presentation. Um, that one's relatively okay to order. VIP is for VIPoma. And a VIPoma is also called uh, endocrine. Is it endocrine cholera? It's cholera. The patient has to have more than two liters of stool per day and market electrolyte abnormality. If your patient doesn't have that, please don't order VIP levels. 5-hydroxy endoacetic acid is for carcinoid. Think of flushing, diarrhea, bronchospasm, all those kind of things. Uh, see if there's any signs there. And if we already did our scans and other stuff, we may have found the, the small bowel lesions or things like that at that point anyway. All right, if there's no obvious cause, then consider a trial of cholesteramine for bile acid malabsorption. Also, again, remember we talked about that, that bowel resection thing. Let's say you get someone with chronic diarrhea and they've had a bowel resection. Please don't feel you have to do this entire test. Just go ahead and get that patient a cholesteramine trial and see if they do better. Also, if the guy has a bunch of bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain could have IBD, you may choose to go ahead and skip to that. So remember, this is not a guaranteed approach you should do on everyone. Kind of use some common sense and the history and everything to kind of help guide you. All right, we'll go through a couple cases. All right, first of all, we have a 32-year-old white male who comes to the clinic with one day of nausea, cramps, and non-bloody diarrhea. He has had 10 bowel movements per day. He has no other associated symptoms of any kind. He has no recent antibiotic use or medications other than omeprazole. No exposure or travel to unclean sources of water. No history of HIV. He reports his wife is also sick, but not as severe. And his exam shows minor abdominal tenderness, but he has no fever. And I should put it there, no signs of clear dehydration. So what type of diarrhea does this patient have? He has what? He has acute diarrhea, right? All right, and it's community acquired also. What's the next best t test in this patient? It's what? Observation. Yeah, it's just observation. We really shouldn't do a big workup. We could suggest that he drinks Pedialyte. We give him a brief course of a few days of loperamide. There's no red flags here in this case. Okay, we have an 84-year-old who comes to the ER complaining of diarrhea for four days with nine bowel movements per day with no blood. He seems a bit confused and is unable to provide additional information, but his address is listed as an urban area. His exam shows no major abdominal pain, but he has a low-grade fever of 100.6. So what type of diarrhea does he have? How long did it last for? Okay, so it's acute, and it's probably community acquired. All right, what's the next best step after that? It's what? And that's because this patient has red flags. He's elderly, he's got a fever. Okay, so we want a CBC, a BMP, and fecal, fecal lactoferrin, right, okay. So we get our CBC, BMP, and lactoferrin. The CBC shows a Y count of 18, a hemoglobin of 12, and a platelets of 148. So that does have an abnormality. His BMP shows hyponatremia, hypokalemia, and a non ion gap acidosis with a little bit of renal failure, but we don't have old labs to compare. Fecal lactoferrin was positive. So what do you want to do now? So if it's positive, it means it's probably not viral, which is the reason we did it. And so what's the next test? Stool cultures, right? OK, do we need O and P in this case? He doesn't really have any risk factors. Be kind of iffy because we have a bad history. We really don't know what's going on. C. diff, would we want to send C. diff in this case? I, again, I'd say that's kind of hit or miss because think about it, we don't really have a good history. If we had a good history, no antibiotics, nothing else, community acquired C. diff less than 2% of acute diarrhea. In that case, it's probably not smart to send it up front because of what we talked about earlier with the high false positive rate of C. diff PCR, right? So don't go willy nilly sending C. diff on everyone who comes with acute diarrhea. In this case, you don't really know though what's happened. So stool culture and this case, you could consider a C. diff PCR and you could consider an O and P because we don't really know what's happening with the patient. C. diff PCR is negative, stool culture is positive for salmonella, and it's sensitive to Cipro. Uh, 
Next case, we have a 64-year-old black man with a history of HIV. He's admitted for a UTI due to enterococcus fecalis. He started on augmentin on day two. On day three, he complains of cramps and diarrhea, and his chart reveals he had six bowel movements overnight that were described as watery. His white count has continued to trend down. So what type of diarrhea does this patient have? Acute nosocomial, right? Okay, what's the next best test in this patient? It's what? It would be considered changing his, his antibiotics, possibly, if you could. Uh, or, lim or using drugs to limit the diarrhea. C. diff is not indicated in this case, right? We always see diarrhea out when they order a C. diff. Again, you get a really high false positive rate. So this case, because the diarrhea started the day after the antibiotics, it's highly unlikely to be C. diff. Now, let's say the patient's white count kept climbing, or the patient got sicker on day, you know, the next day or the day after that and started showing more infectious signs, then you need to go back and reevaluate, and then a C. diff would be an appropriate test. Basically, the point is your pretest probability needs to be good before you send a C. diff PCR. Case number four, we have a 56-year-old with a history of six to eight weeks of non-bloody diarrhea, about four bowel movements a day. He saw his PCP and was treated with Cipro without improvement, and he received a loperamide prescription uh, with improvement, but once the prescription ran out, his diarrhea resumed. He states he has cramps and diarrhea that awakens him at night. So awakening you at night is a flag for what? So it's for, it, Bucigus is not IBS, and it would suggest it's secretory or inflammatory, right? Uh, it doesn't note any relationship to foods. He doesn't consume any diabetic or low-calorie foods. He lives in rural Kentucky and has been hunting, but his city provides his water. He denies any prior operations or pancreatic issues or known cancers. He has no family history of IBD or cancers. And his medication review reveals no laxatives or magnesium-containing compounds or drugs with diarrheal side effects. He does report approximately a five-pound weight loss over the past six months. So what type of diarrhea does this patient have? He has chronic, right? Okay, what's the next best test step in this patient? It was what? Remember, we want to get our, our labs, and we want to look at everything and see if there's any abnormalities first, right? So CBC, CMP, and remember we can check a TSH because it's cheap and an HIV test so that we know what category they have in later. We can also ask the patient to fast and see if it resolves and consider a lactose-free diet. So if CBC shows he has a hemoglobin 11 with an MCV of 81. That could suggest what? Iron deficiency, right? The patient's BMP reveals a non gap acidosis of 18 and a potassium of 3.1. So there are some abnormalities supporting the diarrhea. HIV and TSH are negative. There's no change with his lactose-free diet and no resolution with fast. So what's the next best step now? So we moved from box one, now we're in box two. What was in box two? Lactose therapy. So we want to do a fatty check with Sudan. We want to do a fecal lactoferrin, right? And in occult blood, because combined together they have a very great sensitivity for inflammation. And we want to check out the patient for um, the uh, for the uh, stool light so that we already have it. Stool pH was 6.3, which suggests the patient does not have blood. Carbohydrate, malabsorption. The fecal occult blood and lactoferrin were positive, so that would suggest he may have inflammation. And the patient, Sudan stain was negative, and his stool electrolyte showed an Oswaldo gap of 29. What do I do with that? I don't care, right? That's why I'm going to make sure you don't care about it. We focus on the other stuff first. It's not important. So this patient most likely has inflammatory diarrhea. We would ask, does he have any infectious signs? You could do an infectious work up front first. Still colds are O and P because he does live in a rural area. Consider Giardia, they're all negative. Next, we would go to our imaging and our scopes, right? Which showed no abnormalities. CT did show minor ileal thickening and adenopathy, but wasn't specific. So we're not real sure, but it would be a good test in a case like this. Ileal thickening, scope's negative. Yeah, we do a small bowel follow-through, we could consider a capsule, so it shows shagging mucosa consistent with Crohn's disease. 
All right, 41 year old came over from Somalia, two months of abdominal pain and diarrhea, 13 bowel movements per day, some reported blood in the stool. He's lost 30 pounds, he has no sick contacts, states he gets up three times a night to have bowel movements, but suggests it's secretory, does not know any relationship to foods, he doesn't consume any diabetic or low calorie foods, lives in Louisville, drinks city water, and has no travel since immigration one year ago. Denies any previous operations or pancreatic issues. So again, the duration suggests the patient has chronic diarrhea. What's the next best step? Basic labs, right? TSH and HIV. They show that he has low white count, some other abnormalities, and HIV is positive, and then the follow-up CD4 is 34. So in this case, you could argue to skip all of this and just go to testing for things that happen in HIV patients. You could skip it in. If we didn't, what's the next panel of tests we were? Lactoferrin, occult blood, stool pH, right? Sudan stain in a gap. Stool pH was 7.2, occult blood and fecal lactoferrin are positive, Sudan's negative, O and osmolar gap's 58. What do I do with the osmolar gap? I don't care about it. I'm looking at the lactoferrin and the, the occult blood. In this case, do I think it's structural or infectious? Infectious. And what test do I want to make sure I test in this patient for chronic diarrhea? I want purpose fruity, osteospora, and what did I say the big thing you want to make sure you don't forget to order? A and B's right on the stool. So for Mac and with pants out, can you even order for, a, for an A and B blood culture? So this patient most likely is related to HIV, stool culture, all the regular organisms are negative, O and P was negative, and the A and B was positive for Mac. Okay, we'll do one more and then we'll stop. Okay. We have a 43-year-old white male with a history of anxiety and IBS. He states he has a history of 20 pounds of weight loss in the past year. He notes no changes in stool or blood. In his stool, he denies nausea vomiting, but states he has subjective chills. He reports no well or other contaminated water supplies. He does feel this is worse with eating. He doesn't recall clearly, but doesn't remember ever having diarrhea at night. He has no family history of IV or diarrhea, and his medication review reviews, reveals no diarrheal inducing medications. So this is again chronic, because of duration. The next best step are our labs, CBC, CMP, TSH, HIV. Okay, avoid all that stuff in his diet. He did notice that with the fast, his diarrhea got better. Avoiding lactose products didn't matter. His labs do show a low hemoglobin, um, and his BMP does show some minor electrolyte abnormalities. TSH and HIV were negative. So there are enough red flags with the weight loss and all, we wouldn't really attribute this just to IBS. So what's the next best test? It's always the same, right? What are the next best tests? Lactoferrin, occult blood, what do we do for fat? Sudan stain, and what do we do for carbohydrate? So pH, and then if all those were negative, what test do we need? Okay. So we get those tests. The stool pH is 5.2. What number were we kind of looking for? Less than 5.3 would suggest carbohydrate malabsorption, right? Fecal occult blood test was negative. Sudan stain was positive, which would suggest what? He has a malabsorptive diarrhea. And his stool electrolytes show an osmolar gap of 132, which suggests what? It's not like diarrhea. It's osmotic diarrhea with a positive fat and a low stool pH. I really didn't need this because these two tests are positive. That suggests a malabsorptive disorder. Okay, what category of diarrhea does this likely belong to? It's fatty, right? And then the question is, is it structural or carbohydrate? Which one do we get out of the labs here? Structural would mean pancreatic. So it looks like it's from pan chronic pancreatitis or carbohydrate involved. So carbohydrate looks involved. So what would be the next test in a case with a low stool pH? Starting with a letter. D xylose testing, right? Went away for a little while. Oh, I'll put that. All right. And then. Oh, fatty, I'm sorry, we're on the fatty diarrhea, not osmotic, I got the wrong category. So we do a CT abdomen, uh, you look for structural, and then your EGD showed villus atrophy, 
that wasn't specific and he had no bacterial overgrowth. So we look for bacterial overgrowth syndromes. What would be the next best test in this case? We had a fatty mouth with diarrhea. We know it's not a carbohydrate. That's why we didn't need the D-xylose testing. So D-xylose testing would have gotten us into these tests. So the next test, no bacterial overgrowth, nothing specific on EGD. Some bill is blunting. We could consider what? This would be celiac testing. And we order for celiac testing, we order a transtubular, uh, sorry, a trans tissue glutamate or an endomesial antibody. Both have very similar values. Please don't ever put anti gliadin That's outdated by like 15 years. Um, the sensitivity was only 80% for that test, so no one uses it anymore. So if you wanted those two tests, either one is the correct answer on your board exam. Um, there is a downside to that. We need to send something else with it as well, and that's IgA levels, because TTG and endomesial are both IgA antibodies. If we have an IgA deficiency, they can be false negative. So you send an IgA with it, if its IgA levels were okay and the TTG is abnormal, then it would suggest the patient has celiac disease. Okay, on your board, just keep an eye out for celiac. Keep an eye, keep an eye out for Zollinger Ellison type questions and things like that. And uh, just remember to get yourself in the category so you know generally where you're at with the patient. And if we had even gone to the osmotic one, which I shouldn't have jumped to because we're that positive. But if you go to the osmotic route, you get your D xylose, D xylose is positive, then you look for a malabsorption problem with a small bowel, either celiac disease, whipples, tropical sprue, or they have a carbohydrate problem. So you could do a specific carbohydrate testing or go to, to uh, EGD and scopes from that one.